you have questions. Francis, I am keep exploring if there is a worry or suffering that are not, that are not psychology suffering. One area I can see it maybe that when you understood your consciousness free, when you you are the consciousness, the free of worry, you are, and you are, you are choose to appear as the ignorance. So. And this is can cause worry or suffering at that. So, and this I believe is not psychology suffering. Well, precisely, that's all psychological suffering is about. It's about me as a separate entity. So, if I choose to believe that consciousness is limited and separate then down the road it triggers psychological suffering. Everything about me as a separate person is psychological suffering. Even I know that I am this consciousness, this, this free, and I choose to do that? Well, when you choose to believe to be a separate consciousness, you, cho you have chosen to stop knowing that you are universal consciousness. This chosen is not it's on like, base of the wisdom. It's like Jimmy uh, playing cops and robbers. When Jimmy chooses to play the cop or the robber, then uh, he's going to jail. Remember, as children, when you were playing cops and robbers, if you happened to be the, the robber, you, you were resisting arrest big time. <laughs> Somehow, my understanding say to me, if you know you already that freedom, and you choose to do that, it's kind of <laughs> not make sense for me so much. Your freedom wouldn't be absolute unless you would have the freedom to alienate it. What? To alienate, alienate. The king has the right to become a beggar for one day or for two days or for. But ultimately, he remains the king. But, but it still is the most important task for me, I believe, that expand this uh, wisdom that not appearing as a ignorance. But how does wisdom expand? Do we expand it as a separate entity? Is there anything as a separate entity we can do to expand wisdom? No. So wisdom expands itself through its own intelligence, love, and beauty. We have to recognize that everything we understand about consciousness is impersonal. Understanding is always imperson impersonal. There is not a person who understands. 
the person as an understander is an afterthought that comes after the understanding. But the understander was not present during the understanding. So understanding happens. And then after the understanding, ignorating happens in the form of the understander. Can you explain that one, the ignorance performing and as an understander? The, the separate entity, yes. the separate individual, as a conscious entity, is only a concept that becomes a belief the moment we attach to it, we validate it as being true. But it is never an experience. We never experience a separate consciousness any more than we experience unicorns. We simply believe that the ordinary consciousness we experience is limited. But there is no evidence. Why? Because any evidence about it being limited, any phenomenal evidence about consciousness being limited, would have to appear in and to consciousness, right? Because it is through consciousness that we know everything we know, including any evidence about consciousness. But any information that appears in consciousness has no knowledge of consciousness. Knowing is a one-way street that goes from the knower to the known in, in, in the sense of supremacy. The knower has supremacy over the known. So the known doesn't tell us anything about the knower. Yeah, but we forget that constantly. We, 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 you know, I say that, but then we, it's like it's never been said. That's a problem. Or people say, oh, yes, yes, intellectually, that's very fancy. But that's not what I'm t talking about. I'm not trying to, to be intellectually fancy. I'm not a, a modern philosopher inventing new fancy words or using old words in a fa with a fancy new meaning. Dasein, existence, category, a priori, epoche. That sounds fancy, expensive. <laughs> That's a Louis Vuitton of philosophy. So it mean it not makes sense to be worried about the, any past experience. What you can do is only on the present moment. Yeah, but you want me to say yes to that, so that you can be you stop worrying. No, because if I say yes to that, it doesn't. It, it's not going to make you stop worrying. You know. Eh, eh. You have to experience what I say so that it so that it comes it becomes your own truth and then the truth will have its own effect. 
I mean, I can say yes, you see, yes. In theory, yes. Practically speaking, you have to... <laughs> you have to eat the cake to taste it. And there is, except this conversation, there is something you can help with me with that? There is not a, a helper and a helped. But help is available. All, help is always available. In fact, help is available to those who truly seek it. The problem is not a lack of help. The problem is a lack of serious desire for it. Just as the problem is not a lack of grace, the problem is a lack of serious desire for it and a reluctance to pay the price for it, which is to let go of attachment to all kinds of belief system, systems. <coughs> There is a price to pay in that sense. Freedom has a price, which is to get rid of the fetters. You cannot have both freedom and the fetters. You have to choose. Even if they are made of gold. And this desire needs to build up naturally? Yes, when you are fed up with the lack of freedom, the desire is there. As long as you are happy in your golden cage, I'm not that saying that for you or not for anybody else here. It's about mankind. I think you probably already answered my question in terms of what he asked. What I wanted to ask about was the experience of fear. Um, I, I know that there can't be any how when the fear is really pure. Can you say something about your experience with fear? In fact, there is only one fear that really matters. And it is the fear of absolute disappearance. or of absolute misery. And it is a, a fear which is the part of ignorance that becomes unbearable to us. There are two sides to ignorance. There is a cute side. The front side is cute. The back side is ugly. 
So we want to hide in ignorance the backside, which is this fear, and we do our best to hide it. And we look at the front side, which is cute, which is me as a person. Mm. At some point, we cannot keep not seeing the ugly side. And at some point, it becomes unbearable. That's when we become a truth seeker. And so, liberation, moksha, is, is not the liberation of all the fears. It's the liberation of the root of all fears. Now, the little fears, they play a role, they play a part in life. Uh, when you watch a movie, you are afraid for the, your hero, right? Or that uh, there is not going to be a happy ending to the movie. You are a little bit afraid, but at the same time, I mean, it's easy, you don't want to experience this fear, don't go to the movies, right? It's entirely in your control, under your control, right? So meaning that the reason you go to your movie is because you are enjoying the fear. Imagine a movie in which there is no fear. I mean, no reason to be afraid. I mean, it, what kind of movies, movie is that going to be? Right? You know, everything is smiling, everything, everybody is, is beautiful, everybody is nice. You know, it's such a boring movie. So fear is a, a necessary ingredient of the fun we derive from watching a movie. So there are many fears like that that are okay. You play tennis, right? And you are going to serve, and it's a match point or, or a game point. You're afraid you are not going to serve as well, and then your toss it goes to the side and you miss your first serve, and you don't win the point. But it's an interesting fear, otherwise it's easy, you don't want to experience this fear, don't play tennis, same thing. So, in other words, we enjoy these little fears. So, why wouldn't we deprive ourselves from those? It's a big fear which we want to get rid of. Think about it. Because the big fear, if you will, once it disappears, all the little fears, they remain like free-floating, but they, they have kind of lost their efficiency, their seriousness. They become like playful, like the tennis fear or the movie fear. This life is a game like tennis, and it's also a movie. We are in the movie, playing the game of life, but at the same time, we are also watching the movie. You know, there is a, an Upanishad in which there are two birds on the branch. One is eating the fruit, and the other one is watching the other bird. The one eating the fruit is a little character in the movie. The one watching is the universal consciousness, our real nature.
So, um, my question also has to do with fear. <laughs> So I mentioned to you during the last retreat that There's this fear that I experience in the in the evenings where it's like what you were, I remember you saying something about the etymology of school, you know, like scholae, where after you've taken care of all your practical stuff, then, then it's free time, it's like free time. and. So like as soon as I'm done with work or I've taken care of all my practical matters, it's like as soon as I turn off my computer, there's this anxiety that it's because I know that once all the doing, once there's no more doing this, this silence that is there, all the time will come to the forefront. And so there's this anxiety and then a sense of restlessness. And, you know, I, I really, I spend my entire evening, it's, I'm not doing anything except actively avoiding this silence, you know? So like the activities themselves are meaningless, whether it's, um, watching, I don't know, a show or <laughs> surfing the internet. It's, it, it's all just about avoiding the silence. And, you know, this has been going on for a few months now and I, I don't know because the cycle will be, okay, there's the rest, the agitation, the restlessness, the doing, doing, doing. And then kind of feeling like this is meaning, you know, like what am I, <laughs> this is so retarded. And so then the stopping, and then there will be, you know, the silence, which is not scary at all. You know, it's the silence that's here, when I'm here is so comfortable and natural and like a fish in the ocean. So anyway, the cycle repeats, but I, I'm wondering if I'm kind of stuck in this avoidance cycle, you know, where instead of spending, I don't know, three, four hours every evening just doing nothing except these, I could, I could be, I don't know, practicing the piano or reading a book or something. But somehow that feels like, because at least when I'm avoiding the fear, or the silence, I should say, it's in my periphery. It's not that I'm, I know it's there and I know that I, what I'm doing, but 
I'm just keeping it at bay. Whereas to engage in those other activities, which you know is not, it's, it feels more like a distraction, like not because I really want to do them, but because it kind of just numbs out the fear. The only real question is, are you enjoying it? Like, even enjoying the avoidance, you mean? No, I enjoy playing tennis, I enjoy surfing the net, I enjoy doing many things in life. Hanging out with friends, being on my own, uh, listening to music. I mean, there are many things I enjoy doing, and it changes all the time. Uh, I'm not... You know, in, in, the, in a situation where I say, oh, that's a distraction, I shouldn't be doing that. My life is full of distractions. <laughs> I enjoy distractions. You know, I, I wouldn't like to live in a cave, you know, where the only distraction would be spiders crawling on my skin. <laughs> I'm not that advanced. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes I wonder if I'm, I'm trying too hard to actually do something about perhaps yes <laughs> about the fear rather than just I could just yeah enjoy other activities and yeah, don't not look for pay it. so don't, much attention. Don't look for it unless it looks for you. But I feel like it's always looking for me. <laughs> So, like, don't think of it as avoidance, then? Don't look for war unless war looks for you. And then go for it. Don't look for it unless it looks for you. Don't go on, on a hand for whatever, just enjoy your life. But if something comes that disturbs the peace, then deal with it. But other than that... So, can you elaborate on like, what you mean by deal with it? You know? Investigate at that moment. You know? But other than that, just enjoy life. Because I remember you saying there are two ways to deal with it. You know, one is, well, I mean, you've, you've said several variations of this, but... I say many things. But, <laughs> but so, well, okay. What, what I remember is you saying when the fear is there, don't avoid it and don't try to get rid of it. Yes, when the fear is there, yeah. So, but I, I don't understand... But don't look for it. The if you are if you're happy doing something, you are not afraid at that moment. So don't don't look for fear. The but what if that like it's not that be I'm not happy. a fear hunter? Yeah. Like, I, yes, I. There are times when I am enjoying the activities, um, but oftentimes it feels like. Compensation. Yeah. Yeah. You know. But then, I mean, you can assess for yourself at any given moment, just, it's like, you know, running a, a test, you know, from time to time. Um, I'm, am I enjoying what I am doing? Or do I, do I wholeheartedly agree doing what I am doing at that moment. You know, that's all. And, and, and it has to be innocent. In other words, we don't have to be Einstein or, or, or Churchill or Napoleon or Jesus or Karl Marx or whoever. You know, we don't have to be one of these. Life is simple. We don't have to be a big shot. 
So run this test. What I'm doing, does it, does it come from happiness or from lack? And if it comes from lack, chances are I'm not happy doing what I'm doing. If it comes from happiness, chances are I'm happy doing what I am doing. And then it's innocent. Even it is not spiritually correct to, to be doing that, doesn't matter. To follow your heart is what is spiritually correct. Um, so, going, because you mentioned this thing of lack, because what I've been kind of, uh, the, like when I was dealing with the sense of lack as a bodily sensation, it was a very clear bodily sensation, you know, that I could identify and it's weird because the sense of lack in that form would appear in the mornings, you know? Sometimes I would be... Oh, anyway. And then at some point, it wasn't... I don't know what I did, but it didn't appear again. Um, but the fear, I don't have a specific... I guess my question is, do, is it important to locate the fear as a bodily sensation or something that I can actually see as a, an object? If the fear remains just as a purely physiological mechanism, it's interesting to see it f for such. Because then you disconnect it from the psychological process. And also, by looking at it, you can also see the origin of the episode that has taken place, which is often in a different realm than the body. It's a thought we had. So, so, in ignorance, most of the fear that we experience uh, is just an aftershock, if you will, of a, th a thought. The real earthquake is a thought of separation, a thought of... So even the fear... Absolute disappearance. So even that is a th thought? The fear of absolute disappearance is... Usually, uh, think, think about it. If, if we were not able to think, we would experience only um, fear only in the presence of, uh, of a clear danger. We wouldn't have the ability pro to project ourselves as a separate entity in the past or in the future, right? So fear, if it is instinctual, then it is legitimate fear. For instance, there is a sudden big noise, an explosion nearby, you know, and we will feel a reaction in the body with uh, some adrenaline. If some of us has been trained or have been in combat, they will duck, right? But the, in, in all of those cases, whether it's innate or acquired behavior, it will be natural. There is nothing wrong with that. It's not related to ignorance at all. But then most of the fear comes from projecting myself as a separate person, as a separate consciousness. 
and identifying with his body. And then into the past, into the future, and then there is no, no physical thing exploding in nearby, but there is a thought of absolute disappearance somewhere. A thought of not being loved, a thought of not being accepted, but that also, if I'm not loved, if I'm not accepted, I'm going to be abandoned and I'm going to die and I'm going to. You see, so, so, so. We lose our connection to to the world, to the, the sense of separation, ignorance. We see it everywhere in the, in the world, you know. It's a very prevalent in, in all countries, in all political persuasions. It's amazing. So, I, I think what you're saying is don't pay so much attention to the fear unless it arises. Yeah, because the reason we pay attention is because we, we see it as the enemy to get, we have, of which we have to get rid. But, but uh, and if we understand that there are two types of fear, one which is natural, uh, and there is no need to get rid of that one. Another one which is related to ignorance, which is a direct consequence of it, and that no matter what we do to deal with it, is going to be inefficient for as long as the root cause of it has, no, has not been addressed. So then, the only thing we can do really is address the root cause, which is ignorance. And, and then the fear will take care of itself. And the root cause is to believe still to, more at the belief to level. To believe to be this separate body. But is that belief on the conceptual level that... Oh no, this belief has also roots at the physical level. But at the physical level, it is not fear. The sense of separation at the physical level is skewed, it's not unpleasant. Well, I was, I was asking about the bodily sensation because sometimes, it's only happened a few times, but sometimes, you know, in going back to the sense of lack, it, it was a very strong feeling in the chest of this, uh, in the chest. Where sometimes, when I'm si silent or when this, I'm more, sometimes there will be this feeling very similar, but it's like more in the... Cute, like more the, cute. No, it's um, in the stomach, you know, like this pit of the stomach feeling that's just as excruciating as what I experienced as a sense of lack, but it you know, it's more, I, I don't know what it is, but the cute sensation, I, I associate more with the feeling in the head, you know, because that's very comfortable. Yeah. And but you can have a, a, a very sweet sense of me located here. Also. Yeah, that's true. That's true. You yeah, see? Yeah, yeah. And, it's, and, and often you may have also a feeling of fear located here, but, but it's different. Also, the, the, the location is the same. The experience is different because it was a, with the feeling of fear, there is a kind of contraction in it. And the sense of mm -hmm. me is more Yeah, pleasant. that intimate feeling. It does this. So, so basically the sense of me which is pleasant, I call it cute, and the thought of me which is also pleasant, the reason why they are pleasant is because they are close to the experience of the real me. Mm. So they are kind of uh, 
pregnant, if you will, or fragrant with the perfume of our true nature. That's why. But they are still objects. And they are, they are really a bridge to ignorance. In fact, they are a, a habit of ignorance. Cute in the beginning. We condone it. And then down the road it creates the fear. And then the fear. We don't like it. And it's good that we don't like it because the fact that we don't like it is an incentive for us to go back home. So from the absolute to the sense and the belief of me, that's the bridge that we cross coming out of the garden of Eden, if you will, into the landscape of ignorance. And it is the same bridge that we cross back going to our true nature. In your case, I, I, you know, I would ask myself, and I know the answer, am I serious about the truth? And you are. So this earnestness about the truth can only come from a deep experience. So instead of worrying about this or that, trust that you are already committed to the truth beyond anything that your mind can tell you. And the only thing that matters in your life is this commitment. It is not commitment that we choose as a separate person. It is something else. So then, once you have that, see it as your treasure and then relax in life. Live your life happily. You see, don't worry, live your life happily. Yeah, I, well, I did notice that oftentimes I'm worrying more about the fear than actually. Yeah, you the fear, fear of fear, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, even before I was asking this question, I was thinking it's more to appease the mind, you know, because of this, instead of just trusting the process that I'm looking for some... You know what the message, the fear is telling us? The fear is telling us, don't call me, I'll call you. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, so, I think I have something similar. Who doesn't? <laughs> oh no, I, I'm, I'm unique. Um, so, my avoidance seems to stem from not wanting to face the sense of lack. From? Not wanting to face the sense of lack. The thought, like, if I have to go do some work or something to take care of myself, I'm going to have to face that I'm not good enough, I can't do it, and I'm limited, and I'm going to die. It seems like that fits into what you're talking about. Um, so I just wanted to say, if I could treat it the same way, is, oh, it's, it's back to the story of a separate self. Yeah, everything about me as a person, uh -huh. I mean... Uh, we are all different as, as individuals. We have all different qualities, talents, mm -hmm. skills, uh, given or acquired. And, and we have to see the beauty in us and in others. You see that we are all different. And, uh, and we have to I acknowledge that there is a perfect place for us in the world. Nobody is excluded or from the garden. We just exclude ourselves by believing to be separate. And, and every, we are all welcome in our oneness, you know. And then we see ourselves 
and we see others as beautiful expressions, all different, you know, all different, different, as I say, different flavors, different colors, different sizes, different shapes, different forms of intelligence, artists, some have artistic talents, some have, have intellectual talents, some are, have a cooking talents, some have a sportive talents, I mean, they're all different. What is important is that we, we follow the natural inclination of, of our talent and, and that's the, the compass that helps us in this, is this sense of happiness, you know, how to, what is my heart's deepest desire? In this moment, it can be something apparently stupid. like learning how to dance the tango. Okay, thank you. Another thing was, has to do with the sense of limit at the beginning of, quote unquote, my existence. You know, my earliest memories are from around two, two years old. Yet at that moment, there's already this little kid in a body so my first awareness of, is of like already existing, but no like memory of anything before that. So the mind goes, well, that's sort of when I started. It's, so it's creating like the front end of limitation. As we came into this world, so do we exit. I guess where I'm looking at that whole thing is that's my story of my limit, of the first part. That's like the first end, first part of the story of the limit of yeah, Steve. Yeah, but what, that which appears and whatever appears in memory is, of course, limited. Okay. Whatever appears is limited, yes. But the fact that what appears is limited is no evidence that that to which it appears is limited. So just like anything else, it's another thing to recognize that that doesn't inform me anything about what I am. Think that consciousness is real. Convince yourself that consciousness is real, that there is something about consciousness that we cannot make up. Everything, everything else, in fact, could be made up because everything else could be a dream. But consciousness is the only thing that cannot be dream stuff. Everything else could be dream stuff. But that which dreams the dream is not dream stuff. So, uh, and, and, and that's a connection between consciousness and reality, you see. This, because we have this experience, which is, first, that there is consciousness. And everybody would agree with that, I mean, most people. But then, the second thing, which is given to us, at the same time, so the same experiential fashion as the one through which we know that there is consciousness, we know by the same token the reality of consciousness. You know. And that is usually not emphasized because uh, people would say, okay, yes, consciousness, there is consciousness, no problem. And I'm absolutely certain that I am conscious in this moment. But then, if you, if you would ask them, is consciousness real? They would say, mm, because 
we live in a culture which, through the lack of discrimination, has put consciousness, the witness of the thoughts, in the same category as the thoughts. It's there somewhere in this drawer with the label in it, on it, mind or thought. So, the baby went, went down the drain with the water, right? The, the water was the thought. The thoughts are, of course, not real. They are passing fancies. But the thinker of the thought, which is the reality of the thought, that's a different question. The thinker of the thought is not a thought. Thoughts don't think, right? The thought of what am I going to eat tomorrow doesn't think the thought I have to pay my taxes. Thought A doesn't think thought B. So the thinker of the thought is of an utterly different nature than the thoughts it thinks. And that's what is lost in our culture. That the thinker of the thought is of a different level of reality than the thoughts it thinks. Our culture doesn't grant reality to the thinker of the thoughts. Doesn't grant reality to consciousness. It sees consciousness as an illusion. Whereas it sees this as real. Matter, yes. Consciousness, it's subtle, it's like thoughts. That's the problem. A lack of insight into reality. So, the, the real beginning of liberation is when we establish this connection between consciousness and reality. And in India, it would be Atman equals Brahman. Or Chit equals Sat. Consciousness equals being, truth, reality, that which never comes and goes. So, which is just the opposite of what our culture says, which is that the only thing that's real is that which comes and goes, because it's the only thing that can be noticed and, and objectively observed, that's what's real, but that's what comes and goes. It's the opposite of what's actually real. The problem with this view, this view would make sense if the things that come and go wouldn't be interrelated, if they would be disconnected. But that's not the case in our experience. In other words, it is not like there is one thing appearing here and another thing there and with no connection whatsoever. There are two examples of connection. First is causality, which is a connection between two events and we can verify that. The second example of interconnection are the laws of physics. That shows us that events in the world are deeply connected and even nowadays almost independently from the distance. So that's something. But even, even if we don't talk about the events themselves, the fact that there are laws of the laws of nature shows a deeper connection beyond and behind the individual events. So now that we see that the individual events 
are deeply interconnected. Now we have it. There is a reality behind it that creates this connection. You see? There is, this, there is a global reality. In other words, reality is global. Reality is not atomistic. One more follow-up. Second bite at the apple. <laughs> yes. So, you, usually you said this teaching is about the happiness, but if you choose uh, to be ignorant or uh, truth, wisdom, you are always happy. So really main uh, question is not about that, because you are always happy. The, the, this, Sincere desire for truth, this make it different. Uh, I'm not getting your question. Formulate that differently because I, I don't get your, your because, objection. Because what you said, what is matter is happiness. Yes. So, but if you choose to be ignorant, you are happy. If you choose to be wisdom, of course you are happy. So, this is, not the, this is not the matter. The matter is, look honestly on your desire, because you are always happy. What is your sincere desire for truth? I'm clear or not? Whatever we do comes from happiness, from the exercise of our freedom. And that includes the choice we make of ignorance. And, uh, but at some point, although we make this choice, And the proof that we are happy lies in the fact that we are free to choose. You see? Just as we are free to go to an horror movie, even though when we are inside the movie, we may not enjoy it. But we were free to go into the theater. And we are free to leave the theater. We may watch the movie up until its very end out of laziness or stupidity because we have paid for it or whatever. But, but the fact that we stay in the theater shows that we are enjoying our freedom. Perhaps you are not enjoying the movie any longer. Perhaps in the first minutes we were not enjoying the movie but we are still enjoying our freedom. Perhaps it's cooler in the theater, outside it's hot. There might be other reasons. All beings seek happiness. And Even those who claim, I'm not seeking happiness, I'm seeking suffering, I'm seeking sacrifice. Well, they find their happiness in the sacrifice. So when you say that to people, oh, some acknowledge it, others get offended. It's not politically correct to say that all beings seek happiness. Because then people will tell you, well, but then you're not trying to make my life better. You see? You are, you are forgetting me and me and me and me. You know, you are seeking your happiness. You are an egoist. 
But in fact, they are the egoists because they think you are forgetting me. <laughs> That's the reason I'm saying the honest is be to look sincere what is your desire is for. Because what you choose is you are happy with it. Yes. But then, regarding the desire, there is this thing. All beings seek liberation. But they are divided into, I mean, all beings not. All beings seek liberation or enjoy it. So among those who seek liberation are those who seek it in the wrong direction, which is most of mankind. And it could be see, said that those seek liberation unknowingly. Whereas there is a smaller proportion of true seekers who seek liberation knowingly because they have had a glimpse of it. You know, and, and in the Christian scriptures they say, God says, you wouldn't look for me unless you already knew me. You wouldn't, so translated into, uh, in, in or <laughs> Eastern language, you wouldn't seek liberation unless you already had a glimpse of it, a, a, a fleeting experience of it. And then this last seeking ends like the river that ends in the ocean. The dynamism of the river, the current of the river, that was pulling the water down to the ocean, stops as the river reaches the ocean. In fact, I could use this metaphor a little further. The all beings, knowingly or unknowingly, are like the molecules of water running down along the slope in the rivers. When they reach the ocean, this moment is tantamount to moksha, to the liberation. They are already liberated, right? Because they are already, they have reached the ocean. Nevertheless, through inertia, through the, the acquired momentum, the current continues a little bit into the ocean for a while and then loses itself in the ocean. That residual movement of the water would be tantamount to the residues of ignorance that remain for a while after the liberation. They are there as inertia, but there is no longer the force of gravity acting on them. So, because there is no force propelling any longer I mean, triggering any longer this residual movement, it will come to a natural stop. That's the perfect segue into um, this question about um, the relation between presence and relaxation. Um, it occurred to me during meditation that the presence is always available or on. I mean, our being is being is being. <laughs> um, so there's there's not any sort of sense that like a contraction or sense of anxiety that one, which is the sensation in the body that that limits presence, really. 
but I mean, because these days I'm, I'm noticing that, like there'll be you know contraction and then I notice it and there's just a sense of release or expansion or, and I feel more present, but it's just the mind relaxing, right? It's not, because presence is always there, it's just, you're just opening to it more. But it is presence who opens to itself. <laughs> you I see? Guess it would have to be. There is yeah. not a separate presence that opens to the big presence. Right, I'm not the, doing it. The decision to, to surrender, if you will, comes from presence itself. It's presence surrendering to itself. That, that's the power of it. So when we give up, when we surrender, it's not the separate... Per it is not the separate entity that surrenders the sense of separation. Yeah, that's what's so... So we don't, as a separate entity, we don't surrender. We get surrendered to, <laughs> to the absolute. To the mind, it's very paradoxical. It's like, who's doing this? <laughs> it, it, that which moves the clouds, moves the hearts, and also surrenders. The, because the question comes up always, what do I do, you know? And it seems like all you can do is just notice what's going on. But you can do. When you are open to the possibility that your true nature is universal consciousness, then this body-mind becomes an instrument as a service of it, a servant mm -hmm. of the Absolute. And when we surrender our uh, alleged separation, immediately in this moment we become an instrument in the hands of the Absolute. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of just seeing that uh, being open to it. Getting used to it, almost. Being open sense. to it and, <laughs> and being willing to, to, to act on it, to, to put yeah. it to the test. Yeah, yeah. It's like I, I was just out in the desert for a couple of days and I'll have a moment of inspiration to see something beautiful in the silence and then take, and just naturally I want to take a photograph. Um, and that's just, it's like a natural expression of, there's, yeah, it's just kind of like you're just surrendering to doing what you do naturally. Yes. I, I think uh, the, the beauty of photography and as an art form, I mean, the specificity of it is to catch an instant. You right. see, yeah. it's very different. A painter has all the time to make a portrait, right? And so by this connection with the model, a real artist is not going to just paint the appearance. A real artist as a portrait painter is going to paint the soul in the same way he's going to paint the soul of a landscape or he's going to paint, because there is time, you see. But the photograph takes the instant. You know, there was this great photographer, Cartier-Bresson. Actually, he, he went to India and, you know, nothing happens by chance. And he took these pictures of Ramana Maharshi when he was already old. And uh, he used to say that it's, it's a Zen moment yeah, when, exactly. when he clicks, yeah. I think, you know. The, there is this picture of him which is extraordinary during May 1968, you know, the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. So there is this big graffiti on the wall which, which says, Jouissez sans entrave, uh, which means uh, enjoy your, yourselves without any fetters, without any. Uh, Enjoy yourselves without fetters. And in front of it, there is this old guy, this old bourgeois, you know, in black, with his, uh, his little hat and, uh, and the, the cane, 
looking, so just the opposite of that, you know, all the convention, looking, you know, and at the, at the graffiti in the war, you know, a new world he doesn't understand, you know, and Cartier-Bresson just catches, you know, this moment when two worlds, you know, collide, or two worlds, that's a moment, you know, that's, a, so. yeah, yeah. that's a, the, the art of photography. Well, I, I, I'm trying to bring that art into every moment, <laughs> Uh, so, uh, my question is, the, f the world which has uh, a limitation that our lives like trying to maintain a balance between jobs and stuff. So, in this world the expectation is, or your job expectations are you stay planned, or you think ahead, you think of the future. But in spirituality, it is quite the opposite that you stay in the present, you don't plan. So, how can we find a balance between the two without, without one uh, damaging the other or coming in the way of the other? Well, who said that in spirituality you don't plan? You, know, you see, the apparent uh, conflict or contradiction here uh, hinges around, because the real question about planning for the future is planning for whom? Right? So, if it is planning for consciousness, for the absolute, I mean, the absolute has planned already, so <laughs> there is no need to plan for the absolute, right? Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> now, if it is planning for this body mind or that body mind in my family or my friend or my country or whatever, you know? That's a different matter. Then it's not planning for the absolute. It's planning for this or that. And then the question is, what is good planning? And good planning for that is good planning by the absolute. In other words, to make oneself as a planner transparent with regard to uh, the belief to be a separate entity and be open to the absolute planning for it. In other words, such a planning has to be impersonal, has to be made under the assumption that consciousness is universal, that it, is, it, it shines in all beings, right? And then uh, this planning has to be consistent with truth, love, and beauty. You see, and the best effort has to be made to plan as in accordance with that. Because by doing so, this body-mind puts itself at the service of the absolute, you see. It becomes a universal instrument. And then you will see that this planning, even, even if sometimes it, it seems not to work, in the world, something serendipitous will happen in the world that will kind of justify this planning, you see, that will complete the work because it's a cooperation with the absolute. It is not in opposition with it. When it comes from the person, from me separate, me versus them, me versus others, then it is in conflict with the universe. But yes, so it's okay to plan for retirement. It's okay to plan for college education for your kids. It's okay to, 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 to have a house and, and to have health insurance or whatever. You see what I mean? It's okay. I would say not to do that is not really spiritual. What do you want? You want to, your kids to be miserable? And, and right.
So I'm very new to this practice. Me too. And, <laughs> and it is the first time that I've, I've been doing different meditations, but this one is the first time where it really feels like I've kind of like hit some truth that like just really resonates with me. And one thing I'm noticing that I struggle with is when I'm alone, I think because I'm so new, I... I understand it really well when I'm alone, and it makes a lot of sense when I'm alone, but, um, and I'm able to like practice it well when I'm alone. But then in social situations, it's a lot more difficult to um, not feel like a separate self. And where I just have a question there is, Right now I'm kind of isolating myself because I want to strengthen that practice alone first. And I'm not sure if that's a wise approach. Is it something where I should, yeah, I guess like, should I kind of go through this isolation to really stabilize it by myself before I kind of socialize again? It depends, it depends with whom to socialize. Uh, there are social interaction, interactions that are beneficial, and that th there are social interactions that, at least in the beginning, are not beneficial. So, why not, why, for instance, reject help on the spiritual path. That doesn't make any sense. In my case, I wanted to meet a teacher because I needed to find a living model. And also I had questions, the answer to which I cannot find in books. And, for instance, the main question is inner peace, causeless peace, causeless joy. You know, it's, it's a true human relationships, what they ought to be, you see, the, the, to, to feel open in the presence of others. So the, the guru, in my case, acted like a can opener. So that with him I opened my heart and then it was easier to be open in the presence of like-minded like friends, you know, in the Sangha. And then in the presence of some people outside, you know. And uh, uh, of course, in a perfect world, you would feel comfortable with everybody around it, but you know, with serial killers and rapists, I'm not sure you could feel comfortable. The, the tough yoga exercises are often close in the family, you know. Uh, Mothers, fathers, <laughs> in-laws. <laughs> so, and these are our yoga exercises. They are good, you know, they are there for good reasons. You have to master those exercises. But usually life supplies us with plenty of those that there is no need to seek extra yoga exercises by associating with people who are unpleasant and with whom we have no real need to associate. You see, so this we could keep to a minimum. You know, like what you need professionally, you know, or if you are in, in business, you need, you, you, you need to, to, you have customers, clients, or you have uh, vendors to, to deal with or whatever, but 
Yeah. Uh, also, the first you feel well with yourself or in the presence of your teacher, then in the presence of like-minded friends, then in the presence of other people. And then you feel well in the world. You see, the world loves you. Life loves you. Life likes you. you know. As you get rid voluntarily of your sense of separation, life gets rid of her sense of separation towards you. You see? It's a two-way street. So that you, you become really a true citizen of the world. It is your world, you see? It, you are the world, the world is you. It is this blending with the world, which is, in a sense, the final stage of liberation. Don't reject help if your heart desires it. Don't seek it if your heart doesn't. True help will never be prescriptive or coercive. True help will just be suggest, just su suggestive, but then you, you ponder it and you, you are your own guide ultimately in, on this path. Understanding is very important because we own our understanding, you see. We, we are free in our un understanding. So understanding comes from our freedom. And what we understand then implements itself sooner or later. In my case, I often say that, but since you... Uh, the way I become interested in spiritual matters, because my parents were atheists, I was raised as an atheist and as a scientist. So, it's a double whammy, you see. So, anything religious or spiritual was a no-no. You know, I had kind of some allergy to it. So, my problem was that I was not feeling comfortable in social situations. And uh, one day, Trying to solve this problem, I picked up a book in a bookstore, which was by Krishnamurti. And that was a revelation. And Krishnamurti was okay because he, he would say, religions are all bullshit, you know, things like that. So that it was petting <laughs> my ego in the right direction. <laughs> you see? So, so, but through him, but there was something else, you know. So, so what he made me understand was that this specific problem I was trying to solve was not the real problem. That there was a deeper issue, which was the belief to be an ego, to be a separate entity, that was the mother of all the problems. And from that moment on, I became so interested in this new direction of investigation that I, I stopped any attempt to cure myself from this discomfort I was experiencing in social situation. And then, so I exclusively devoted my energy to this search. Then two years later, I encountered my master, my teacher, my guru, and then perhaps two years later, one day I realized in a social situation that 90% of my discomfort had disappeared without me doing anything to that end. And that the 10% residual that seemed to be there was there for good reason. Because there are people, when you associate with them, you experience discomfort for good reason, because it is God telling you, get the hell out of here.
Thank you. Francis, you mentioned earlier with um, Farzad something about uh, inertia, and um, I don't know, I think that struck a chord with me because I feel like there's a lot of things that I do that's just like, I don't know, I kind of go along with, um, I don't know, it, they, they just feel more like habitual patterns of separation. Like, why the hell am I still? Yeah, but these are what are what is called the vasanas. Mm. But the, the, worst, the worst habit of all, by far, is me as a person. So it is the one we have to detect first. For instance, if we, th if we th think vasanas are my problem, for whom? <laughs> you see? So here you have it, you discover then through so your understanding that vasanas are not the problem the problem is the one who is having a problem with the vasanas. Mm. <laughs> yeah. See? So, so it's important to go always to the root cause and not to waste our time with ancillary issues such as the vasanas. Mm. Because uh, it's the same thing as the, the previous question. I could have spent the rest of my life trying to get rid of my shyness. But that wouldn't have any, done anything about my fear of, I don't know, of being sick, of my fear of what may happen to, may happen to my children, my, my, my fear of losing my job, my fear of this, of this, of that. You see? Yeah, so I guess my, um, where I've been... Uh, my usual kind of approach whenever I see these habitual patterns, it is like, to what does this arise? You know, it's self-inquiry, like, what am I? Um, those, yeah, just the kind of self-inquiry questions. Like, yeah, but, yeah, but at some point, so what happens then? What happens then is, um, yeah, there's what have you, a contraction, a habitual pattern, to what does this arise? I don't know. Um, and then there's kind of a netty-netty thing, like I see, okay, so I'm not that, not that, not that, not that, not that. Um, yeah, but you see, <laughs> to ask the question, to whom or to what does this arise? What is the answer to this question? When you do that, what is the answer that comes to you? Um, I mean, it's not really like a positive... I'm asking you. Yeah. The, I, what is the answer that comes to you when you ask this question? I mean, it's never really an answer. It's, it's more of a... It just kind of opens me up for, mm. I don't know, but I haven't really gotten like some positive. If I were to, ans to ask myself this question, 
the answer that will come is, would be, oh, I was just believing again to be separate. And then, immediately, that would be the end of it. You see what I mean? Yeah. In other words, I wouldn't have the, the impression to be in front of a wall asking, who am I, who am I? And yeah. there is no answer. It would be very different. Hmm. Because if you ask, who am I, what am I? And the wall, neti, no, I'm not this, I'm not this. Neti, neti. There is something, there is a missing link here. That's why I told you, what if that would happen to me? What would, what would happen? Would, what would happen is that I would be catching myself red-handed, believing to be separate. Mm -hmm. And then that would be the end of it. Okay. Why? Why would that be the end of it? Because I have investigated this separation business long enough and thoroughly enough to be absolutely certain, absolutely certain, that there is no evidence in support of this separation. So then there is no attachment to this concept any longer, you see? Mm. That's why it's, that would be the end of it at that moment. And, and, and an end of it which is, would be 100% satisfactory. In other words, that wouldn't leave any, any leftovers. It's 100% satisfactory for a time, I guess. <laughs> and that, then... that would be like less than 100% satisfactory gotcha. if it is for a time. <laughs> Gotcha. We, we have to see that any attempt in the inquiry that is aimed at maximizing our comfort <laughs> is a very different attempt from an attempt which is asking the question, what is true? Mm. Truth and personal comfort <laughs> are very different goals. Right. So we have to ask ourselves, what is my goal? Is it truth or is it personal comfort? I think maybe a part of me was under the impression that they might be one and the same, but <laughs> maybe not. Certainly not. Thank you.